Okay, so this is going to be a brief uh, spoken introduction to motivational interviewing and the uh, quiz assessments will be drawn from these slides and then from the selected key reading and that will be supported by some tutorial activities that we will do online where we um, bounce some ideas of good and bad practice and unpack uh, how that comes about and how to try and optimize your practice. And we might also be able to schedule something in the lecture slot, which would be an online interactive discussion where there are some key things that would be good to unpack in that time as well. Uh, so motivational interviewing really comes down to uh, a way of interacting with people um, with a, a clear goal, a clear purpose, um, but it's based on the principles of motivation theories that we've developed over time, uh, in particular self-determination theory. And then also um, counselling theory, which is again got some different angles, but primarily it's built around uh, focusing on the person's needs and their own narrative, their own experiences, their own story as being a primary way of actually getting better outcomes. And it very much steers us away from um, taking an approach of I'm the expert, I know best which feels counterintuitive because we've worked very hard to become an expert in all these different uh, classes and subjects. But usually as a recipient of the information, people don't respond well to simply being told that. And we've seen that time and again over the years. Only a select band of people will say, well, the expert says so, so I'd best do it. And what you actually tend to see is that we need to start with the person's own lived experience, um, connect dots, um, reinforce and sort of build with what they're giving us and very little of the interaction says look here's some stuff that I paid a lot of money to learn so therefore it must be good and that again tends to be counterintuitive we're going to walk through the current challenges um, the basic definitions uh, we're going to look at how it's done but of course in a, in a lecture that's very hard to um, do, so I'll be asking you in the tute if, if you're able to actually submit some examples of yourself trying to do this sort of technique and just see how that's going and maybe some good and bad examples so you can tease out what you think are the key uh, differentiating factors. Um, and that towards the end signposts for us some of the language that you'll see in um, participants and clients as they begin to navigate through this and you'll see the language they use can be indicative of whether they're thinking of making a change or not. So in this area, and motivational interviewing can be used for all sorts of things from uh, smoking cessation, um, addiction cessation, uh, obviously in this case physical activity and exercise promotion. So in this case, exercise and activity levels are the key or avoiding sedentariness. Uh, because we know that uh, the vast majority of people do not um, participate enough in being active and also um, don't maintain it. So even if they've been told or prescribed by a doctor or um, steered by a practitioner, sometimes it still doesn't stick. So we need to try and navigate towards um, sustainable, maintained behaviour changes. And that happens through a much more um, collaborative conversation. Because what we want ultimately is, is clients um, engaging in physical activity, whether it be with a sports club, whether it be through exercise physiology, physiotherapy, um, any of these things, we're ultimately looking for clients who are actually activated, engaged, energised, aware and informed, and not just informed of the theory, but informed of how it applies to their life, their lived life right now, and then motivated. And of course, motivated... Um, we don't tend to think of motivation just on a scale from high to low or energized to flat. What we tend to think about is the nature of the motivation from uh, extrinsic, feeling you have to do something, otherwise there'll be some bad consequences. Or you might be paid or gained something, but it's very much an extrins external to you. Um, and it usually feels quite manipulative. So in the short term, that can work. And if there's lots of extrinsic factors, again, it, it can work usually in the short term, but it doesn't tend to be sustained. So what we're really looking for is actually more intrinsic forms of motivation. And people tend to um, evolve down the spectrum from something they did initially because uh, they felt they had to. And then they gradually internalize reasons and find their own reasons, which are actually more rewarding. So by the end, you've got uh, intrinsic motivation, the person uh, has their own reasons, 
they uh, it's to do with experience and passion and emotion and it's like I do this because I enjoy it I always I feel like I always will and it's much more of a um, personal thing and of course um, that's difficult to find it's difficult to prescribe in advance so we can say everyone would react to an incentive but we can't be sure that everyone uh, will react to the same intrinsic reason the same experience the same emotion so that's what we're ultimately looking for as we try and navigate someone towards being more optimally motivated as opposed to simply more motivated. So this uh, thing we're talking about needs defining is obviously there's two words motivational and interviewing. One focuses on uh, the theories and knowledge we have about what works for motivation and the other is the interaction style. And interviewing of course generally implies uh, one-to-one typically. There are lots of definitions, um, but they tend to have a similar pattern. So it's usually uh, the focus which is different, as in what outcome am I trying to achieve, as opposed to the um, mechanics of actually what it means. It's normally just the focus which is different. So we might start very broad and say, look, it's a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation. So not giving them motivation, not persuading them, strengthening their own motivation and commitment towards change. And then as a practitioner, you might say, okay, it's a person-centered, so client-centered counseling style uh, for addressing the common problem of ambivalence about change. And again, counseling, when I was um, first training as a counselor, used to catch me out repeatedly because I felt obliged to be an expert. And I felt obliged to share all the knowledge that I had carefully built up. And if people would say something that was wrong, I would sometimes step in and say, that's actually not how it works. But in this particular approach, in counselling theory and in motivational interviewing too, we don't do that. So we hold back and sometimes put aside completely all the expertise and knowledge we've built up and we focus as much as we can on trying to understand the client's worldview, the client's experiences, their constraints, their limitations and work with the materials that they're giving us. Um, And that even sometimes means um, restraining from even passing judgment you know you trying to prevent yourself from reacting in a way that suggests you think maybe they're saying something incorrect it's really quite challenging to suppress those and in a normal day-to-day conversation we might be able to convey those emotions and those feelings and those ideas but in this counseling based approach and counseling theory is very strong on this that's not um, viewed as helpful and there's some good research showing that actually this tends to work better So more technically, collaborative goal-oriented style. So the main difference between this and counselling is that in counselling, you simply follow the client's lead uh, and they might actually not even know what their uh, aims or goals are when they're talking to you. And that can become something that's worked out during the conversation. Whereas in motivational interviewing, there's very clearly uh, a goal and normally it's to become more active. It might not be to um, achieve a certain level of fitness or to achieve the national guidelines but it might simply be a little bit more and then a little bit more again. So it's it's a different way of thinking about um, the goal, but the goal is usually um, something you will try and focus on and agree and negotiate, but there'll be a goal, whereas in counselling there normally isn't. It's a style of communication, as we've been saying, um, and it actually has a particular um, attention on the language being used by the client especially. And you'll see that towards the end, there are some examples of the different types of language that might be um, adopted to suggest whether they're thinking of changing or not. Um, It's designed to strengthen the person's own motivation, so it's not to give them motivation. Um, And it's committing to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring. So that word comes up a lot, eliciting, where we look at um, what would that feel like? How would you feel? How would you think? What else could you do if you actually managed to make this change? So it's trying to explore a currently hypothetical future and see whether the person um, connects to that and whether that becomes the motivation, at least to begin with. So the atmosphere is also of acceptance and compassion. So as I say, very little in terms of judgment, very little in terms of um, I'm the expert. It's all about accepting the person's um, narrative to begin with and then exploring it and working out which bits can be um, become the foundations for change and which bits um, we almost just move on and okay, that bit seems to be a problem, so let's just work our way around 
uh, that particular experience. So when we break it down, we tend to look at um, a couple of key themes that come through, and they're the relational spirit, uh, the way that we try and interact with the person, uh, there are technical um, elements of active listening, uh, and then the four processes that people tend to go through. And that's uh, really one simple diagram, which I'll try and spend a few moments explaining. So the underlying spirit, the relational aspect, is it's very much about collaboration. So there's no not meant to be as much, if any, power dynamic, where there's an expert in charge dictating down to someone um, you know, asking for help. And so some interactions in professional settings have that nature, you know, I'm the expert, do as I say, but motivational interviewing doesn't, and it doesn't for important reasons. So it's, it's been proposed and researched and good evidence backs it up to say that if you have the time and resources to take this approach, you can get much better outcomes that are sustained and that persist. And that comes from taking a collaborative uh, style where we're both exploring the issue together rather than someone saying, I know best, you should go and do this, and not actually necessarily helping with the how. So there's a lot of focus here on the immediate how. To do that requires an element of acceptance and compassion, so accepting the client's um, journey and story and not trying to question uh, particularly, and understanding and a degree of empathy and compassion to say that, you know, sometimes, oh, that does sound challenging, that does sound tricky, uh, at least in the beginning, to show that we really do, it's not just sort of to try and con someone, that we really do uh, understand and care and um, you know, resonate with the emotions. Because people might be uh, insecure, frustrated, um, they might be protective and clamming up. So there are many ways in which um, by being accepting and compassionate, we can get through some of the initial barriers and actually have a meaningful conversation around what for this particular person might be helpful. So there are some of the key themes. And then the bit where we do try to explore what could change is through what they call evocation. evocation. So looking at um, if this happened, if you uh, sustained this for so long, how would you feel? What else could be possible? How would your family think, feel about that? Those types of questions to evoke the hypothetical future, explore how it could come about, uh, what it would enable and what the benefits might be. And that's um, a key aspect of the interaction. So uh, a good friend of mine, we have a running joke whereby um, when he's trying to persuade someone to do something they absolutely don't want to do, uh, he will often say this phrase around, is there any possible benefit in sticking with this? Is there anything we ha haven't thought of that might become an accidental um, perk of pursuing this seemingly terrible idea? And we've now got to the point where we say, mate, we know what you're doing, stop it. But for a while it was quite effective actually at just keeping the conversation going and moving us towards thinking about this difficult, unpleasant thing, sometimes much more favorably and positively. So the technical skills um, are generally summarized by this acronym AWS, which uh, tends to guide us towards what we're trying to do and the uh, mechanics of how that's done. We ask open-ended questions, uh, so not sort of constraining someone to yes, no answers, or even very short sort of single phrase, single word answers. We try and avoid that as much as possible and ask questions like how and, and maybe what, or can you describe, which is more kind of um, guiding someone to talk for a bit longer. Can you describe for me? Can you help me understand? And those types of questions tend to get a bit of a longer answer in more detail. So we want to open questions that don't constrain people. We want to um, affirm, and that's different to simply saying, I agree, that's correct. It's very much more about um, trying to reinforce elements that could become the building blocks of the future um, change. So you're looking to say, okay, that sounds uh, difficult. Okay, I get it. That sounds promising. That sounds like it would really uh, feel good if you achieved that. So we're looking to affirm things which seem uh, promising as, as kind of the foundations and building blocks of where we're trying to go. There's an element of reflective listening. So typically uh, there are some key skills around paying attention, but also actually showing that we're um, taking it in and demonstrating to the person that we're hearing it 
and sometimes checking understanding as well uh, is very important. And then there's summarizing sometimes where we just simply say, I, I think this is what we've got from the interaction so far. And sometimes that's a good way of simply checking to see if the person agrees. And especially when it comes to setting goals, you really want to check and summarize. Here's what I think we're committing to do here. There's an extra one sometimes thrown in around elaboration, which is to say, um, can you just ex expand on that for me? I'm not sure I, I get it yet. Um, can you uh, tell me how that happens? So it's just looking for additional details. And I think I tend to draw a distinction between what I call a journalistic interview style, where we often just ask the questions on the paper and just rattle along, keep changing subject. Whereas this approach focuses very much on developing a genuine understanding of that person's world and day-to-day -day life. And so you'll often find yourself asking, can you just help me understand a bit more about that? Can I, because I don't know your life. Or even, uh, here's what I understand by that word you just used. Is that what you meant when you said it? And some of those questions can be really helpful in flushing out misunderstandings and preventing flawed assumptions. Open questions, again, can be a real stumbling block for people. So I think it's worth pausing for a moment to say, okay, let's, let's unpack this because um, we tend very easily to gravitate towards what, when, uh, how long, very specific questions. And yet this uh, approach is asking us to do the exact opposite. And this approach has been supported in research. So we're left going, okay, well then what's this magical thing, open questions? Um, we tend to try and just not constrain the person to specific answers. So how do you feel about your current activity level? Uh, what worries do you have about your current um, ability to, to, to exercise, for example? And that could focus on just uh, disadvantages of the current situation, but that's very different from uh, saying, obviously your current situation is not working. I'm the expert, I know best. And it's, um, it's very different from saying, how often do you get to the gym? Because uh, again, that almost implies as a correct answer or are you meeting the physical activity guidelines? Yes or no. Those are very close answers that constrain the person to only really say a short thing and, and it's correct or it's not correct to some extent. Uh, you could do the same thing for I believe, the advantages of making a change. Um, how do you feel about trying to make this change? What might get in the way? Um, what might help you? So it's very much about um, exploring all the time and not um, allowing our assumptions or our preferences to constrain the person's answers. And you can, you can play with this as well. So you might be able to say, okay, a fairly closed question with a yes, no answer. Can't you see what your diet is doing to your health? Um, which is going to evoke two responses probably, um, maybe yes or no, but then a defensive um, but, and here's why it is this way. So you've almost turned it into a power dynamic, a game of negotiating rather than a collaboration. So what might be a different approach? You might say something like, in what ways does your current diet affect your health? Um, and you might expand that to the health of the people around you. Do you all tend to eat the same thing or do you actually um, eat different things each day? Aren't you concerned? Again, has a kind of yes, no, and it's more likely to then be followed up by a defensive answer. Um, and you want to avoid that as much as possible and not get into a sort of game of negotiating and persuading. You might say, okay, how would you feel if you were able to make this change? How would you feel um, day to day? How would you feel if it was sustained for a long time? And again, so rather than asking someone, are you thinking about changing your lifestyle, which might simply get you a yes, no answer, and it might get, again, quite defensive. I, I wasn't thinking about it. The doctor sent me here. I kind of feel like I have to, but um, I, I wasn't that interested before. Not a productive progressing us along towards the change. And instead you might ask, okay, um, what are your thoughts about changing your lifestyle? Which gives free reign, really, to sort of go anywhere with it. Um, it could be... The, the person sort of just starts talking in a similar vein, but then um, they've not been constrained by a kind of yes, no, I know I should be. They're just kind of being encouraged. What would, how would you feel? How would you think what might um, be better or worse if you were able to do this? And that's a, just a different um, experience for the person answering the question. 
So the affirmations are kind of um, interesting because we tend to think of that as kind of these unconditionally positive statements like you can do it or um, reinforcing a particular thing that we happen to think is correct or that we agree with. And both of those are not what is being referred to here. So instead of talking about taking what is there in front of us, what the person is giving us through their story and the picture they're painting for us, and trying to firm up the things that can become the foundations for moving forwards. So it's looking to almost um, check, of course, but then re reinforce, that sounds like an opportunity. That sounds like um, a problem you've solved in a similar sphere. That sounds like you used to do this all the time and maybe you, you're familiar with this, but it's just kind of life got busy. So we're looking to grab all the things that seem promising and build with those. So they become the foundations and the building blocks of this journey towards change. Um, and that hopefully gives the person a mixture of kind of um, self-efficacy and confidence um, and hopefully changes their perception around what's possible. Because often in these moments when someone's actually got to the point where they're asking for help or um, needing help, um, the, the same picture could be viewed very differently. And they just need to be able to see different opportunities and avenues for making change, for making progress. So we almost um, do influence the conversation and influence the journey, not by being an expert and saying, I know best, but by looking at what's being provided, the picture that's being painted for us, and looking for patterns where we can reinforce and say, okay, that could be the way we move forwards, that could be um, promising. So not yes, correct, I agree, not well done, but um, this sounds promising, this sounds like you've done it before, uh, this sounds like you actually would really enjoy this if you could do it. So it's looking to um, reinforce those things, firm up those beliefs and ideas. Um, and while it's tempting, and even yeah, in the short term, quite rewarding almost to give that praise and say, yes, well done, we know that that's not what's being asked. And you'll see the same thing in the reading. And if you go and read beyond the recommended reading, you'll see the same thing comes up. And it's the same in counselling theory too. We don't want to be uh, inserting our judgments and beliefs and preferences into the um, conversation. So reflective listening is um, one of the kind of superpowers of both counselling and motivational interviewing. Um, it kind of, in a nutshell, is used to mop up and avoid any miscommunications, misunderstandings. But I think it also has wonderful other benefits in terms of really demonstrating that you're listening, building the kind of alliance and collaborative tone. Um, and actually, it, it's a key difference from the kind of waiting to take your turn in the conversation, where people just tend to almost stop listening because they're thinking they've got a thing to say next. And instead, it's actually about um, really proactively demonstrating that you're with them on their journey, focused on their problem, and not almost following your own agenda. And that's quite different to a normal conversation and different to a kind of expert uh, client kind of interaction. And that's important because there's so many ways that um, uh, com communication can break down. So a person can simply um, not quite say what they meant. The person can not interpret what's being said. Um, sometimes in a noisy background, things could not be heard properly. And so the only chance to reconnect that and check you're both on the same page is actually to have some kind of reflection. And again, uh, there's much less opportunity for misunderstandings and clashing agendas because we're only focusing on the other person's issues and agenda. So examples might simply be um, bouncing back what was said, and you'd be amazed how often that leads to more elaboration, exploration, reframing, just simply checking what was said or, uh, you know, so what I'm hearing here is that this is a really difficult issue you've been facing for a long time. And something as simple as that could actually get the person talking and exploring. And of course, it's showing that you're listening. Sometimes you might want to um, amplify something which might have been suppressed or hidden. Sometimes you tell their story and they don't really um, convey that it's been really hard and really emotional or frustrating. So it's okay to say, what I'm hearing here is this story. And if, 
if I'm reading it correctly, that was quite difficult, and they might then ex expand more. That was quite challenging, that was quite frustrating. And it's okay, because you want to make sure that that's tr correct, so it's okay sometimes to check your understanding, and they go, no, it wasn't that bad. I didn't even notice. It's only now that it's become a problem. And you go, okay, that's interesting. So um, it, it, didn't, it wasn't a problem at the time. It's only almost now it's too late or now it's becoming an issue. Then it's, it's having these consequences. So I don't see it as a problem to be wrong. I see it as a problem to not check because that's when um, people can end up on very different pages. Um, sometimes you might even try and uh, sort of reflect a little bit of... Um, other options, other angles, other perspectives. Sometimes you might um, kind of replay the, their message in a different voice even, just to sort of see if it sounds different. Because uh, sometimes they say things and you go, oh, that, that kind of sounds like a really kind of complacent, like meh. And you might just put a different tone on the, um, the words they're saying. So sorry, my example was quite bad, but um, sometimes it's, it's good to actually just, just shift the emphasis slightly um, and it can and not quite going as far as do you know how you sound but just um, adding in a little bit of um, reframing uh, and focusing on the kind of uh, the emotion maybe the helplessness just if you allow those things to come through and you're reflecting back sometimes it can just kind of um, begin to evoke a different way of thinking or a different perspective, adopting a different perspective and going, oh, I can see how that would be uh, viewed. And I was like, I don't I feel that way about other people. So gosh, maybe I should change. So it's okay. Uh, some of these things, the more challenging you become, the more you require a good relationship first. So it wouldn't be something in the first session where you kind of playfully try to um, change someone's perspective. Or it'd be very unlikely in the first session. Uh, sometimes you can offer a different perspective um, or um, stories to say, okay, this same thing happened once and it actually, it, it is possible to change it and it was done by looking at it this way. So it's, um, I think it's possible to begin as, as you've built up a lot of trust to kind of, and if you really do understand the situation very well and you've, you've demonstrated that over time, to then start saying, okay, yeah, so there are some other ways uh, what, how would you feel if uh, this was the primary way of thinking about it? How would you feel if um, you weren't so focused on being stressed and busy and instead you were focused on uh, having a healthy, happy lifestyle? And if that became the priority. And it could be the same situation, just viewed slightly differently. Um, it might be that you simply try and... Uh, point the person towards their own role and influence in the, in the interaction. Uh, so what elements of this can you control? What elements of this can you influence? And sometimes that um, encourages people to think about uh, what they can do as opposed to feeling like a victim. And that's not a nice feeling to be out of control and have the world simply happening to you. So it's important sometimes to, to pause and say, what, what could you influence or do? Or even this, what's the smallest change you could make in this situation? Uh, and sometimes the opportunities for control almost stop you know, at, at the level of the skin. But then sometimes there are things you can physically do. Sometimes I have no choice and all I can control is my reaction. But sometimes I can actually do something to make it better for myself or someone else. And that's worthwhile. As you again look to be perhaps a bit more playful sometimes, you can um, role model the negative influences and the constraints uh, and see if the person can actually formulate arguments against that uh, as they become better at um, navigating these problems. And if you find someone who's been going to the gym for a couple of years, you're probably going to get a different um, response to, oh, how would you react to a busy day? How would you react to um, a bit of a disaster coming through first thing in the morning by email? And you might find the person says, okay, well, I would put that you know, in my to-do list, and then I would go to the gym anyway. Whereas somebody else might say, I need to jump straight on there and I'll probably just uh, put the gym kit back in the car. And so you're looking to try and, if someone is uh, able to problem solve, you can sometimes then play with that and um, challenge them more. Probably further down the journey though, I suspect. And then of course, there's just simply summarizing 
what you think is being heard and uh, checking the bigger picture because you'll spend moments right down in the depths of these minutiae of detail and sometimes you want to come back out and actually summarize which I think is the next one there we go so we look to draw together and sort of paint this bigger picture and so everything kind of makes sense when seen at once and that's important because if you zoom out and everything still doesn't make sense we're not really um, any further along we've just got lots of tiny problems and stories and vignettes we want to be able to step out from the detail and actually see a picture that makes sense and tells us perhaps how to move forwards and if that's the case if you can see that and you're checking it with the client then hopefully they can see it too and so they hear their own story they see the patterns and the sort of landscape that they're in and that often is quite empowering and so um, there are some great examples of um, of clients in my life for example who um getting to the end of the session saying, do you know, I'm not sure if I've helped you at all. And they're saying, no, no, you didn't need to. I just needed to be able to see it all myself. And that's what's happened. So thank you very much. And if you get that response, that's a wonderful sign that it's kind of gone to plan. It's gone well. And then you might be able to pause and say, okay, so what do you think you might do here differently? And then, then maybe we can write that down for next time. Um, but that's a good sign when the person uh, feels like they have control and it's probably a good sign if you feel like you haven't stepped in and done something um, specific you've just been the sounding board uh, the only key difference between this and counseling is that you're a sounding board about a particular goal which is um, the, the main defining feature here between counseling and motivational interviewing so uh, only really two more themes to go through the four processes and the language of change the processes really um, build from this idea of engaging and building up as much detail as possible and that's crucial and so it's worthwhile to spend time engaging just sharing discussing building up this big picture and that's more important than uh, demonstrating how clever you are more important than getting a contract signed or getting some goals set, build up this big picture of the person's world and how it's affecting them right now and how they would feel if it could be changed. And that's the foundation. From there, you can begin to focus on some key elements which might be worth changing or which might empower and enable the change because most people come to this with capabilities and skills and experiences that maybe unique to them, but may actually be their key superpowers in making these important changes to their lives. So look for areas of focus that look really promising and then begin to evoke uh, how could this happen? How would you feel if it was to end up that way? How would you feel if it could be sustained? What might be the barriers and how will you navigate those? So we're evoking a hypothetical future, but not just a description, the emotions, the mechanics, the problem solving. And from there, we can begin to have specific plans, um, which are much more focused than simply a SMART goal, because they're actually the processes and the mechanics of these other things that I will do. If I see this, then I will do that. And that's much more process focused than simply a level of achievement to aim for. So the last thing, which can be a little bit tricky, and I might even stumble a bit, is just looking at the different types of language that you hear as a person navigates through these problems. But they could, becoming sensitive to this language can be quite helpful. And uh, for example, in the tutes where you look to um, examine and unpack some examples of motivational interviewing, uh, you might be able to use this language element as a key indicator of what you think is going happening for the client. So a key distinction might be the difference between sustained talk versus change talk. Um, what indicates that a person is maybe looking to get back to how things are, or if they've made a change, this is the key, are they looking to sustain the change? So you, but you'll hear indicators of maybe uh, keeping things going, either in the undesirable configuration or in the new change configuration. 
Uh, and you sometimes hear instead um, change talk where people are talking about what they are committing to, the actions they're taking, the energy they're feeling. So sustained talk typically will be about, you know, what does the person desire? What do they feel able to do? Uh, what are the reasons? Uh, which is more of a cognitive, I understand why, but then that's different to the reality and the emotions and all the other stuff. So we're looking for that combination of desire, ability, reasons and needs all um, aligning in the way that we want. So all the desires are positive, the ability seems to be there and the person's confident. Uh, they see the reasons and they feel like they need to do it and that's a good combination. But you could rephrase all of those to be um, unhelpful and you'd be in a much different situation asking different questions with different focus. Um, then we also look more at the preparatory change talk around um, maybe getting ready to change as opposed to being in it and navigating it. Um, so if the person sort of uh, looks like they want, wish, like, prefer in terms of desire, uh, you might hear words like I can, I could, I'm able, I'm capable in terms of ability. Uh, you might hear uh, the kind of more logical reasoning. Um, you know, I know I should because X, Y, Z in terms of looking at the reasons. Um, and then people often feel like I have to, I've got to, I really need to, all those sorts of things in terms of indicating needs. And they would be things which if they're in the, the desired direction, in the agreed direction of the agreed goal, we would look to affirm and reinforce and say, okay, that sounds promising. Um, how can we make that happen for you? And of course, if they're um, talking about maybe going back to how it was before, we would look to try and, I suppose, question that. But you can distinguish between preparatory and mobilizing where um, people are actually making changes. You know, will, I'm going to. Um, I might, I'm probably be thinking about it, I'm hoping to. And again, they're things that you can pick up and reinforce if they're going in the desired direction. Um, but you could look to explore, unpack, challenge if they're talking about barriers and reasons to stop. So we look really to use these kind of um, microscopic instances of language as indicators to help us navigate um, towards this agreed goal and the goal needs to be agreed somehow it might only be quite vague to begin with like I know I ought to do something but by the end we're looking to plot the person's journey from whatever's happening now in a more healthy um, optimal desirable direction and in this particular topic we're defining that as being more active and more exercise but this technique has been evolved in many different areas of behavior change um, and you could just as easily apply it right now to hygiene and, and hand washing, for example. So there are some key indicators, but then you can also look at um, disconnections like ambivalence and discord and see if the person's um, not showing the emotions to su suggest that it's a good idea uh, or not connecting to the importance. Um, sometimes you might just see a person doesn't really agree or understand and there would be reasons to pause and check and clarify the understanding. Um, not to in, enforce your understanding but rather to sort of check okay it feels like um, maybe you're not sure of this, it feels like um, you're not experiencing uh, any positive emotions when talking about this. It feels like you're a little bit um, numb to this situation at the moment. Is that is that a fair summary, reflection? And I think it's worth um, being sensitive to those things and not necessarily sort of trying to push your way through or gloss over them because resolving those discords and um, ambivalences can sometimes, uh, again, become key foundations. They build trust. Uh, they show it's collaborative. So it's sometimes coming back to the spirit, the relational spirit, the collaborative tone, uh, summarizing, reflecting, that's more important than, than hoping that you might get a change in behavior after one hour. Uh, so the relationship and the interaction is probably more important than um, getting a commitment from someone which they might not follow through. 
So there's plenty of writing about this, ranging from chapters that summarise it through to research that also um, seems to broadly support it. The recommended reading I'm going to be giving you is from Jeff Brecken, um, who actually helped me to write the slides because this is his topic area. Um, and he comes across here once a year at the moment to do some research. So um, really great guy. It seems to me to be a fairly accessible uh, chapter that really summarises what we're on about here. Um, but there's so much more out there. So if this sort of resonates with you for some reason or becomes a topic you want to pursue, or you want to simply use it in your practice, there's plenty of other reading and resources you could be searching for. So by all means, don't be afraid to do that either. I hope that was a nice introduction uh, and hopefully that's given you enough now to kick on and, um, and keep learning. See ya.